So for today, moving forward series episode, it's time to look at NYCFC. And not only the fact that, yet again, it's another frustrating early playoff exit that NYCFC has to suffer, but this year, the way that they got eliminated in the playoffs has to be the most painful way compared to past playoff exit in the last couple of seasons. I mean, when you end up to be on the wrong end of one of the most memorable playoff game and probably the craziest PK shootout I've ever seen against Orlando City, yeah, that pretty much ex just explains why this has to be the most painful way to get eliminated in the playoffs and probably even more more painful than than how they got eliminated in the playoffs in the past couple of season. Now, in terms of their overall season, they finished with a record of 12-3-8 and eight, and they finished with 39 points. They scored 37 goals this season, which was kind of miraculous that they were able to get back to a respectable mark in terms of their goal scoring record this season because I remember in their first five games of the season, they only scored one goal in the first five games and it definitely looked like they were on verge of potentially having the worst goal scoring scoring record in league history but thankfully in the second half of the season they started to figure things out and they were able to get themselves back to a respectful 37 goals that they scored this season uh they allowed 25 goals this season with a goal differential of plus 12 and they finished fifth in the eastern conference but as i said they suffer a painful elimination by orlando city in that crazy first round eastern conference playoff game now, in terms of MVP for this team, there really isn't one that I could choose that that really stands out as the MVP of this team, which is kind of interesting because in the past year, I would usually go with either Maxi Morales or David Villa as the MVP of this team because, you know, Maxi Morales, at least for the past couple of seasons, has been NYCFC standout player and probably consider one of the best number 10 in the league with him consistently putting double digit assists every season and then David Villa for the first couple of season until just two years ago when he decided to announce his retirement was one of the most lethal goal scored and really their go-to goal scored for the first couple of season but this year it's kind of interesting how there was no real standout player from this team and instead the way that they were able to find success at least in the second half of the season is that most of these guys were able to step up in terms of scoring goals and assists and you can even see in the top goal scored and the top assist leader chart that all five of those guys on the top goal scored and the top assist leader chart are pretty close in terms of goal scored and assists and it just kind of just shows an example of how it seemed like it's a team effort the way that they are able to get three points and sometimes when you're able to be successful because you, you put in a team effort that could be a very good good recipe of of potentially be, be successful in this league or even go into a deep playoff run because when you're facing seeing a team like nycfc that have multiple guys that can definitely hurt you that is definitely harder to try to figure out compared to if you're going to be facing a, a team that only have like one standout player or even two standout player where if you can stop them, then you can definitely limit the attack. That, of course, was not the case with NYCFC with the way that they have just multiple guys that can definitely hurt you on the attack. Now, the disappointing player for this season, it's got to be Bear. And what's kind of disappointing that I will say picking Bear is that you know, he only played half of the season for NYCFC because he suffered that torn ACL near the middle of the season that pretty much kept him out. But before that, you know, just a couple of weeks after he's, he suffered a torn ACL, he finally were able to score his first goal of the season and really finally broke out that shackle and the curse that he's been where he just haven't able to find a way to score goals and was kind of in that typical striker kind of form form where when you don't don't able to find find goals and aren't able to put the ball into the back and that you go through a long goal scoring drought where things are are just gonna not come to you and you just don't have any luck in terms of scoring goals and that you also will feel like the goal is much smaller with the way that that you are in a very bad form and in a goal scoring drought Oh, that is exactly what Aber was kind of endure in the second second season, and to think that in the first season where he had such a breakout season, almost challenging for the Golden Boot with him scoring double digit goal, nobody would have thought that in his second season, even if he's going to go through like a sophomore slump 
that he would just completely fail off the map and just have time problem in terms of finding the ball into the back 10 net and i'm pretty sure for nycfc they hope that once he does come back from this torn acl injury he could potentially find his form that he did in the first se season with this team but that being said he's going to turn 30 heading into next year and by the time that he does come back to this team most likely he is going to be either getting close or have already turned 30 and usually when you have strikers especially when they turn their 30s and they're trying to recover from a serious injury most of them don't usually recover the the great form that they had suffer suffer a, a serious injury like aber has suffered when they're in the 30 30s compared to players that might be 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 younger and they might be able to find way to figure out out the, or find ways to get back to their good scoring form so We'll see whether or not if that is going to be the case and whether if Aber is going to potentially find it himself back into to that good goal scoring form that he had in his first season with NYCFC. Now, in terms of the top goal scorer, you got Tati Castellanos with six goals, followed by Jesus Medina with five goals. Then you have three players that was tied with four goals in Anton Tinnerholm, Alexander Ring, and Alexandro Matrita. What's interesting about those three players is that only one of them is, is now on the act active NYCFC roster with Anton Tinholm, the only one being on this team since Alex Ring. We know a couple of weeks ago he was part of that blockbuster move where NYCFC decided to trade him to Austin FC, and they, of course, got $1.5 million general allocation money in return. And Alexandro Mitrita still currently on loan with a Middle Eastern team, and we don't know if he does come back to NYCFC team, whether if he's still going to get minutes for this team or the fact that they potentially could be sell, sold him off. Or maybe that Middle Eastern team that currently have Alexandro Mitrita on loan is just going to buy him, him and sign him on a permanent basis. Now, top assist leader for this team, unsurprisingly, it's Maxi Morales. But what is surprising is that he is actually tied with three other players in terms of the top assist leader. And he didn't get double-digit assists. And I think this is the first season that he has in, with NYCFC where he didn't register double assist. But obviously, I, I'm going to give him the pass. The fact that, you know, he this is a shortened season. And he's been spending more time on the IR that, than actually on the pitch. And the fact that he was still able to register four assists and still be able to be tied with Anton Tinnerholm and Alexander Ring for the stop, spot of the top assist leader. Just just to show how good of a number 10 he, he is when he, of course, is healthy. And it's also kind of miraculous that that, of course, is the case. Case that he's still able to be the top assist le leader despite so playing limited minutes. Then you got Tati Castellanos with three assists, followed by Alexandro Matrita with two assists to round off the list. So what went right for NYCFC this season? Well, at least they ride the ship after a poor start to the season. And this is obviously going back to what I said, how they were were pretty much bottom of the Eastern Conference after their their first two game, and then pretty much in their first five game, they still remain at the bottom of the Eastern Conference with them only scoring one goals. And there was a lot of people, including myself, that was probably saying that Ronnie Dalia could potentially be the first head coach to be be fired this season well thankfully he did eventually ride the ship and he did did eventually get this team playing kind of like the nycfc off the o in the second half of the season and they end up recovering from that poor start by finishing fifth in the eastern conference uh the defense was pretty decent throughout this season and if there's one thing that i think think nycfc at least was consistent this year was that the defense was was pretty good throughout the year and there wasn't really one any games where they just got completely blown out and this is a team that also does doesn't give up like more than three or four goals a lot throughout the season if any at all from from last season uh and then the third thing that went right is at least they made it to the quarterfinal of the mls's back tournament and i know this also kind of kind of means that they got eliminated in the quarterfinal and that it doesn't really shake the narrative the fact that this nycfc team still cannot find a way to get back past the second round no matter if it's in the playoffs or in this case the mls is back tournament but having said that after how bad that that nycfc look in the first two game of the 
the the group stage and that they just miraculously got into the knockout round by winning one nothing against Inter Miami. I think NYCFC fans will take it the fact that they were able to make it to the quarterfinal and they were able to beat one of the finalists from the 2019 MLS Cup in TFC in the round of 16. So yeah, I don't think they would mind the fact that they would get to the quarterfinal despite the fact that they definitely did not look good for majority part of the tournament. So what went wrong with this NYCFC team? And remember how I said that the attack eventually kind of figured things out in the second half of the season? Well, at times it did eventually figure it out, but then there were times where it looked like the attack from the first five games of the season. I mean, there were times where they could put five past their hated intercity rival, that is the New York Red Bulls in the Hudson River Derby by winning 5-2 against them. And then there's times where they're, despite the fact that their defense was able to keep a team to zero shots in the entire game, and yet the attack wasn't able to to score a goal and pretty much score the same amount of goal as the defense able to keep their opposition to zero sh shots in the entire game which by the way I know a lot of people will always remember NYCFC this season suffered that embarrassing thing defeat against Orlando City in the PK shootout in the playoffs but a lot of people will, should not have forgotten that this team also made an unwanted record of being the only team in MLS history to hold a team to zero shots in the entire game and yet they're still unable to get all three points during that game as it was the case in that game against DC United um, in, in phase one of, of the MLS season. Uh, the second thing that went wrong for this team is injuries. Uh, I mentioned Maxi Morales, a guy, guy that, that's been on the IR list a lot during this season. And Aber basically he was done for the season in the mid, middle of the year but there was also a lot more injuries that kind of hamper for this team and that also might play to a role of why they were at times being a little bit inconsistent on the attack and that they were kind of, kind of struggling throughout well, a couple part of the spell of this season and then the third thing that went wrong for them yeah I mean they end up on the wrong end of, of a crazy playoff PK shootout and I know everybody will Again, we'll always remember the the embarrassing way of how they they how still don't win a PK shootout despite the fact that that Orlando City had to put an outfield play, player to basically finish out the PK shootout. But people always for, for, forget that NYCFC they were up by a, up a man for the entire part of extra time and also for the last 10, 10 minutes of the game and the fact that they they didn't finish the game off and had to bring this game all the way to a penalty shootout could e is easily as embarrassing as the way that they of course got 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 knocked out and lost the pk shootout despite the fact that they 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 were facing an outfield player for the last couple of rounds and again that that last part is pretty much just kind of sums up of just how embarrassing that elimination and how painful that elimination has to be now moving forward for this nycfc team well so far in the off season it seemed like they are looking to do some some squad reshuffle and it seemed like they also are kind of entering a transitional period uh today they of course decided to sell another import, important player from their team in ron no matarita to fc cincinnati and then we know a couple of weeks ago they made that blockbuster move to to sell Alex Ring to Austin FC in exchange for $1.5 million general allocation money. And despite the fact that NYCFC did get a whole chunk of that money for Alex Ring, that I think is going to be tough for NYCFC to overcome, even with that much money they received. Because Alex Ring, as I mentioned, he is probably one of the best defender and probably one of the most versatile defender in this league. And he was just such a leader and kind of a heart and soul to this NYCFC team. So when you decide to sell sell your defender and yourself and decide to sell your heart and soul player to another team this offseason, yeah, I expect there's probably going to be some regression for NYCFC heading into next season and that this could be a sign of them just really going through a transitional period knowing the fact that the t current team that they had maybe is not enough in terms of getting them themselves past the first, second, or maybe finally getting themselves into the the conference final. But that that also, so being said, you know, I also think that this offseason they're going to definitely make some signings and that they're going to try to maybe 
use that general allocation money that they got for Alex Ring in terms of replacing him. But they also maybe need to find some option on the attacking end too. Because right now, when you look at that number nine row, uh, Tati Castiano, despite the fact that he was the top goal scorer, half of the goals that he scored, he scored that made him the top goal scorer was in that in that Hudson River derby. And otherwise, he's been been kind of inconsistent throughout the season. And then of course, Aber, you don't know if he's going to be com coming back to to form heading into next season so yeah they definitely need to potentially find a number nine in that spot and then of course they most importantly you know this is something i mentioned a lot with nycfc but i'm going to mention it again they need to find a replacement for maxi morales or at least prepare to make a replacement for maxi morales because i really think morales he is really coming to the end of his his career and that maybe he has another season or two before he's going to hit up his boots and when that happens they need to eventually find a replacement to try and to to replace the quality and and the assist that he has for the past couple of season now the second thing moving forward for nycfc is that ronnie delio will be back on the hot seat next season now you're probably thinking wait a minute if nycfc is in a transitional period why is delia is going to be on the hot seat because of it well the reason why i think he's going to be on the hot seat again is because because I know that this this own, this front office and the city football group they do not want to see this team fail. Like they already seen this team fail multiple times in the playoffs. The last thing they want is to see this team now not even making the the playoffs. And knowing the fact that NYCFC has a his, history of getting rid of their head coach or either their head coach decide to to move on to another team, I won't be surprised if Ronnie Delia could could be fired by the end end of next season if the resort is not going to come and that you know most nycfc head coach have not last more than than two or even three seasons with this team patrick vieira is still the longest tenure for this team and what he only lasts like two or three seasons with this year so yeah ronnie dalia is going to be back on the hot seat next season even if they're going to be going through a transitional period and even if this team might not be as good as what we've seen in the past couple of years and then finally the last thing for nycfc yeah any stadium update you guys i mean i know you guys have said that you're probably going to build that stadium just south south of the bronx or even in 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 brooklyn there like like the the ports but there that's pretty much it i mean all i hear is just speculation but there's nothing else i heard about any finalization that they they're gonna build build that stadium and you know i know this has kind of started becoming a meme and that i'm gonna continue to, to put that as part of the moving for, forward series for nycfc until they build a stadium but in reality i really hope they get a stadium soon because i think it is absolutely ridiculous the fact that they are playing at, at yankee stadium and that we're in an, an era of mls where we should not be seeing teams still playing playing in stadium that is not soccer specific or even in baseball stadium in this place like this would be something if it was maybe about 15 or 20 years ago this would wouldn't be be a big problem but we're now in the era where a lot of teams are getting soccer specific stadium and the fact that that nycfc is still playing in a baseball stadium which no not only the fact that i think their fans are probably frustrated that they have probably the worst stadium in the league but in general just watching the game on tv and just watching them them play at yankee stadium it, it's just it, it's an absolute ice sore every time i have to endure with them them playing at, at yankee stadium and i'm just really hoping eventually they are going to get get a a soccer specific stadium not just only for the fans sake that they deserve to have a team to play in an actual soccer specific stadium and not have to share a ten tenure with another team but it's also for the view viewer standpoint the fact that they they shouldn't have to ha to deal with a grunting kind of uh, of standpoint of the fact that oh great now we're gonna have to watch nycfc play in a stadium that is absolutely god awful with not only the camera angle of the 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 way the viewing experience but just the way that it makes no sense whatsoever why they're still playing at yankee stadium and still playing in clearly a stadium that was not designed designed for for soccer for this many many years but either way there you have it that is pretty much it for my moving forward series let me know in the comments below what do you 
think of this video and if you're an NYCFC fan, what do you think went right, what went wrong, and most importantly, moving forward, what do you think your team is going to do during this offseason? But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video and I will see you guys next time.